Hi Jane, I'm Annette Harkus from Harkus Design. I'm a Sydney graphic designer. This piece, um, my mother gave it to me about 10 years ago, which was a drawing that I did when I was five years old. Um, I lived in Malaysia. This is what most makes this drawing quite ironic of a cottage with snow. Um, obviously I was drawing from a Christmas card or something like that and I went to um, a Scottish school, the Lodge Preparatory School, and it was entered into a, a, a drawing competition or something, which I won. So at the age of five, I'm drawing cottages and snow and imagining somewhere other than the hot tropics, <laughs> two degrees away from the equator. So it's uh, why, how it sort of got me started, I suppose, is that it's um, the imagination part and the kind of exotic place that we lived. And it was a very, very different childhood to um, when we come back to Australia, what my friends were and my cousins were experiencing. So it was quite different. I enjoyed that difference and the exploring and the very different education system. So a lot of reading, no television. And so very um, out there, but also quite self-sufficient in yourself. And I think that's what started me on entertaining myself with my drawings and imagining. So obviously technology's paid an enormous part in the change. Um, but in essence of the creativity and methodology, I think it's pretty much the same process that people have to go through, but it's a different scenario in terms of the, um, even the idea of being a graphic designer is um, a different thing to when I was um, studying, initially studying, people didn't even know what it was or what you would end up doing when you actually had a job, um, if you got a job. Uh, it was though an offering as a, a commercial aspect of doing something creative and that really was the only vehicle available in that I think will always make changes throughout any profession and industry. But in terms of um, process and um, creativity, I think that's um, still, and methodology that you practice in design, I think that's still the same. Uh, I also think too though the opportunities for designers these days to go into numerous different disciplines and activities and actually have an impact is very different to when I first started. Uh, I studied at UTS, um, but it was called then Sydney College of the Arts, which was a new concept school um, college where we were actually blended together with visual artists as well um, and photographers and fashion designers and interior designers. Um, Arthur Layden, was, uh, who's a doyen of design, uh, Australian design, um, he was um, charged with the responsibility of putting together the very eclectic group of um, lecturers. So it was a very exciting time to be in graphic design. My year that we went in was actually the first year it became a degree course from the very beginning. We were down in this very sort of um, urban industrial space at White Bay down near the um, petrol tankers and things like that. The old Ampol building, I think it was. was. Um, but it was a very um, different in terms of the education process. It was very hands-on and um, tactile. We did sculpture, we did screen printing, all those kind of craft aspects as well as the design aspects. Um, we had one hour of computing a week in the first year and then never again. So we didn't do any computer studies, you know, training or skill based stuff on the computer at all. Well, I was working before I left college. I actually had clients um, and it came throughout through my illustration um, things that people had seen. I was started hand painting t-shirts and um, people saw them and some quite well-known people saw them who had fashion shops and fashion, who created fashion. So I was approached to do um, it was um, a, a group called, uh, and this was is what it ended up being, um, went through numerous different um, projects for other people, um, but uh, it was called Kangaroochee and I did, so I had them as clients before I even left college. 
um, I did I, I did actually take a job for six weeks um, and it was doing annual reports and in those days it was the reams of galleys of type that you'd have to stick down and um, I discovered then I was not really a documents person um, and it was actually more towards the the integration of vis you know vision and uh, visual things and imagery and type was actually something that interested me more. Well, as a family friend, um, my godmother, Auntie Grace, and her daughter was a huge influence, which was um, Sharon Storia. She's now Sharon Storia Lynham. Um, but she lived um, what I perceived to be quite a glamorous life, where she was in London designing book covers and books and record covers and next minute, and, and then obviously coming back to Australia and being with Vogue for many, many years. Yeah. So it seemed to be the idea of a, a life doing things that you loved. And as I was quite passionate about um, doing creative things, that really appealed to me. And it was also the aspect of um, working on a multiplicity of things, um, that you weren't limited. And also you weren't limited to being um, just in one place. You could do that. It was an, a travelling profession. I think learning the history of any thing is important. Um, I think it's really great to know where something has um, come from and its journey through to be able to understand it. Um, and I think understanding is um, in the nature of what we, we do anyway as part of our job is to actually understand where it's coming from to actually work out a solution. So understanding um, our little part in history and where we are and where we are in the world. Um, it's also positive to actually know how that actually works in a global situation of how we relate to other um, professions and other designers around the world. So if you don't understand your own history, you're not going to understand somebody else's and how you play a part in that. I'll just go back to that because I found that really interesting that you weren't actually limited by the, the way you expressed yourself. You know, you were given the freedom to express it in whatever way you felt was appropriate, which I think is fabulous training for a graphic designer because it's not necessarily that you have to be the best at doing that thing in, in that medium, but you have to have an understanding of it or a, an idea of it to be able to use it in your job. So where you commission somebody else. I mean, we're always commissioning other people to actually take part in the projects that we do. But it's, it's the non-limitation aspect that if you're open to different ways of expressing it, then you know, you're, you're actually gonna be a richer designer for it and your work is going to be richer as well. Like, um, you know, whether we get made something made in ceramic or whether we, um, you know, commission a three, um, um, you know, motion imagery or um, animations and it's just how you're resolving your idea that you're actually not limiting yourself in how that idea is resolved and what the best one is for it, yeah. Um, in terms of other designers, um, I think belonging to something like Agda has been extraordinarily positive for me. Um, uh, you know, collectively talking to all your peers. And, and also what happens is that you meet people from different age groups as well, you know, different people um, within um, varied stages of their career. But it's quite collegiate, it can be quite collegiate and really positive. Um, I met mentors like Arthur Layden. I mean, he was also at my college as well. Um, a lot of our lecturers like Harry Williamson and Peter Powditch, you know, so one's an artist and one's a graphic designer. Um, and they, you know, um, greatly um, enriched um, your view of graphic design and the, what you were doing in your work. Uh, Gordon Andrews and so through those kind of people you get introduced to all these other amazing people I mean Gordon Andrew who designed a currency who, who could design everything he was actually a true universal designer um, it, furniture fabric sculptures and he was just an inspiration amazing man um, 
So it's been very inter interesting journey meeting other peers and their different ways of doing work as well. It's um, eye-opening. In the sense of um, my studio and over the 30 odd years that um, I've been, been in existence, uh, the fabulous people that have um, worked for me and a lot of them have been women. Um, and I'm quite proud of the fact that each of those people have seen how um, I've managed my studio and that, that learning process in not to be scared to speak about money, not to be scared to, you know, stick to your guns in terms of the work and the work ethic and the results of the projects and your directions. Um, being able to reasonably um, express yourself to clients and extract the correct information. But that all whole learning process, um, I think each, there's probably mm, at least 10 women that have worked with me that have gone off to set up their own studios, um, which I think is very empowering and I'm extraordinarily proud of. Other than that, I do, um, I do a bit of talking with students, um, various different um, education bodies. Um, I have done quite a lot of national speaking. Um, and I do do mentoring for um, some of my the younger designers around, uh, which I found extraordinarily beneficial to me. I had a, um, an older graphic designer. You know, I'd never worked for anybody. I didn't even know how to set up a studio, but he, you know, taught me about job numbers and um, timesheets and um, all that kind of um, rigorous stuff that you kind of go, oh, it's not important. In running a studio, it's extraordinarily important, being accountable for your time and being um, able to be able to charge for it. Um, well, what we do is a lot of packaging now, um, but that certainly wasn't where I started off. I started off illustration and graphics and then that took me through just the normal process of doing um, identities for people but it's as this your growth and stature grows in terms of the different types of clients you get the different people that you're um, associating with go oh you can help me with this project so you actually start learning about lots of different other aspects of designs and disciplines so you know with um, all the interior designers and architects that I knew I started getting three-dimensional signage projects and that took me into three dimensions and then also that led into packaging. So it's kind of been a journey. It's not like you stop doing other parts of design, but the focus um, or the benefit that I have found over the history of um, the studio is that packaging has actually withstood the recessions. And I think I've been through about four or five now. So, and we're about to come up with another one in a year or so. So the Trump factor. Um, it will be um, in essence of um, graphic design where other, like, you know, it was fashionable then you would do web design or it was fashionable and you do digital or, you know, you are, and, and it's like, you know, user experience stuff or it's like it ebbs and flows in people what they say is going to be the next focus of the design area where people do their training. In reality, if you actually have a general methodology of how you proceed in, you know, um, you, the, in, the varied interests of your work, you will always get work. You know, it's, it depends on your level of interest and how you're willing to learn and grow and change or um, bring people in that help you learn and change. Um, that makes the, a studio adaptable and weather a whole lot of changes and still be around in 32 years. Maybe some people are saying I shouldn't be around in 32 years. But it's, it's that um, design still excites me. I still do a lot of illustration work myself. I still do a lot of design work. I'm an active designer. I haven't gone into the management mode. Um, I still do strategy and um, a lot of other more corporate work but the packaging aspect has is starting with the brand identity and taking it through into the first iteration which is the three-dimensional packaging aspect and then you go on and do all the other kind of collateral which is part of a normal suite of what a graphic designer would be traditionally be doing but that 
the discipline of packaging has weathered the storm, I believe, because no matter what happens, the, I, the things on a package always have to change. And whether they're gonna spend a lot of money in advertising or not, recession or not, they, the package is the first thing that hits the um, consumer's eye. So that is actually the most effective and um, cost-effective way to make changes during tight times. I think it's a benefit for most designers to be visible, obviously to attract clients, uh, whether you're female or male. Uh, what happens in our industry particularly is that there are less female studio owners um, traditionally in awards and um, sort of competitions that you put your name in to actually make your name visible. Um, a lot of studios just put the studio name and don't recognise the in individual contributions from the designers. I think that's a really bad move, personally. Um, and we've been very stringent always of crediting um, all the contributors. That's how I originally started getting, uh, becoming visible in terms of um, to other designers as well as um, clients. Not so much clients in that aspect, but the um, recognition that you get does actually lead to more work and how you've responded to that and the success of that leads to greater things. So the visible aspect is important if you actually want to run a studio and a successful one. Um, you have to put your um, voice out there and as I've mentioned before about you know doing speaking at various um, different venues and um, having opinions about things and voicing that being active in the um, industry I think's um, terrific. I think women tend to be more recessive within the industry. It's, it's kind of embarrassing when you go to some of the lectures sometimes and you know you go to something else in another country and everyone's putting their hands up and there's 20, 20 zillion questions being asked. Australians are very, very reticent and um, we're less so uh, voluble in wanting our own individual voice being heard. And I think we do in some ways have to step up a bit. Um, when I thought it was going to be 300 people and then I went to the art centre and this, you know, dress circle and whatever. Um, yes, and I had a, um, a technological glitch in the middle of mine, which was quite embarrassing. Uh, not Nothing to do with me, I'm, I didn't do it, but after you've done rehearsals and the whole shebang with everything. But I managed to talk my way through it. Um, what's the best part of AGI ideas, which was just so amazing, was meeting all those fabulous people. I mean, I think it was just uh, uh, Ken Cato was genius putting it together and the the varied people. And that's what I was talking about before, about the different influences and the different things that you experience, how, you know, the greater good and the greater addition that you can have with multiple interests. I mean, you know, the guy that made all those amazing sculptures walk on the beach. And I mean, like, really, it's not necessarily to do with design, but it's actually about experiences that enrich your work and your life. I don't think you as a person have to be out there by any means but you do have to make your work visible. Um, so there are ways and means of being what you call a quiet designer. Um, but it's, again, that if you send out a series of postcards of your work, you know, it's not like you physically have to go out there. It's actually being seen, you know, the work. I think that's the best approach. Um, and the other thing is, is also speaking to other designers. I, I don't think you have to be an extroverted person by any means. Um, but the work does have to speak for itself. Um, I found that the title was um, perpetuating a bit of a stereotype in a way that we don't necessarily want women to remain invisible, do we? Um, and I understand that there are strengths in you know, positive and negative spaces and things like that of being quietly, quietly. But I don't, I think women um, are a huge proportion of 
the graphic design industry. And yet, proportionally, that weight and power, if we can call it power, um, is not resting with the women. Uh, they don't actually have that equal share. So the, ter the title um, Invisible Women to me seems to be um, perpetuating that rather than flipping that on its head saying how do we make women less invisible and not just asking the women about that but also asking the men because I don't think they half the time really even notice. I, I really don't. It was, just, well, it's a, you know, I've just started up my studio and, like, why don't the women just go and do it? They don't really recognise um, that there is an issue. I, I'm not saying it's an issue. It's it's more um, a phenomena that women tend to want to be more recessive. Sorry, less risk-taking is probably my answer. And it is a risk to start up your studio. But I don't think you necessarily have to have your own studio to be heard. You know, it's actually within the um, companies and design studios, there needs to be more um, encouragement for women to actually move up through the um, process and to be seen. And it's that making the visible, I think, so. Um, a really good proactive and actionable thing that should happen because you go to um, Recollective and you know a whole lot of the sites about history of graphic design. Um, Dominic has just done the most fantastic job and all hats off to him. There's now a lot of women on there now, which is before I think there was about one. I mean, but that's, that's one guy doing it all himself, uh, which is a fantastic resource. Um, there's a lot of interesting people on there.